Thank you everybody's attention. Well, I want to welcome you to the Bedard Theater, Aussie Public Library. Uh, my name is Steve Dewey, I'm the Chairman of the Landlord Tenant Relations Council. And uh, as we do uh, everything in many meetings, we'd like to start with the Pledge of, of the Allegiance to the Flag. Mayor is with us tonight, Mayor Garrity. Would you please lead us in the pledge? Our flag is to my right. Please stand. And Mayor, it's all yours. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Why, thank you. So here's the, uh, here's the deal. Uh, we're going to have some fun tonight. We're going to talk about a dry subject, a little bit of law, a little bit about who we are. So this is unique. This is the first time. This is our coming out party. Uh, this is the first time we've had this presentation, so you are along with us making history for the, this council. We're trying to tell the folks what's going on and who we are, what we do. I would like to introduce uh, the co-chairperson is Julie Johnson here at the door. And Alfina Goodson, who has the person who has put this entire presentation together, and Gretchen Metzloff. So, I would be remiss as a fellow firefighter to tell you that if there's a problem, don't panic. There's a fire exit over here. There's a fire exit over here. Take your time. Mr. Sylvester and I will get you out accordingly. If you begin to fall asleep during our presentation, you want to get up. There is a fire exit over here. A fire exit. <laughs> We're going to move this right along. If you want this to take two to three hours, don't ask any questions. If you want this to take about half hour, 40 minutes, which we planned, ask questions and we'll move you right out of here. That's how this works, okay? So with that, there are some uh, handouts here that we have for you. We'll be talking about them during the uh, publication. With us tonight, have some folks we want to thank for being here. Mayor Garrity is here with us this evening, one of the big pushers on this council. <laughs> Trustee Week 11 was one of our first trustees. Uh, to help formulate the council that you see here tonight. So Trustee Levin is with us. <laughs> Trustee Manny Casada is now the liaison to the council. He is here with us as well. <laughs> a little later on, I'm going to talk about the law. Sorry, but we'll get into it because there's some landlords and tenants. I want you to know your rights and what happened and changes in the law. And one of the most inspirational persons up in Albany that stood up for asking, I know she doesn't want to be announced, but your assembly person, Sandy Galeth, is with us tonight. Thank you for your time. Uh, she stood up for us, and uh, we talked about this at the Village Fair, and uh, I know that she did the right thing for us, and it's, it's difficult. But we'll go through some of these laws and these changes uh, with you. So I would like to turn this over to the person who put this whole party together for you, all the slides, all the mics, everything you see, is Althema Goodson. Thank you. established in 2017. We are made up of nine members. We are appointed by our Board of Trustees, three landlords, three tenants, and a mix. To date, we have had over 30 intakes to our council, and we have helped people. And we are one of the very few landlord-tenant councils in New York State. First off, we just want to stress that we do not provide legal advice, even though we have lawyers on our council, we do not provide legal advice. We provide research into community housing programs. We help to formulate programs to improve landlord-tenant relations. We provide advice to the Board of Trustees on the landlord-tenant programs, and we resolve disputes through mediation and other avenues. How to fill out an intake. I know we have landlords and tenants here. If you've never had to fill out one, or if by the end of this presentation you feel you may need to, here is how to fill out one. You will go to our website, which is www.villageofossening.org, and then click on the Landlord and Tenant Relations Council tab. When you get there, you will see our intake form. If you will fill the form out with as much information as possible that you know, and then you can submit this form in two ways. You can submit it in person at the village office, which for those of you who may not know, it's 16 Croton Avenue on the second floor, or you may email us 
<clears throat> at ltrc at villageofosming.org. And I will turn it over to Gretchen to tell you about Lisa. Please be advised that the information presented is for reference only. You should contact an attorney relative to any legal questions you may have. You may have. The LTRC strongly encourages both parties to enter into a written lease. The lease will establish who the tenant is and or if additional tenants are liable to the lease or any guarantors to the lease. A residential lease is a contract between an owner or lesser of a premises who rents, leases, or otherwise gives possession of the premises to a lessee generally in exchange for payment of rent. A residential lease may be oral or in writing. A written lease protects the parties under New York State laws. There are various protections and requirements that protect and obligate the landlord and tenant. Once a written lease period has expired and the parties have not executed a written lease renewal, and the tenant remains in possession of the premises thereafter, all the terms of the written lease apply except duration. When any doubt arises on the subject, use the adage, rent is rent, security is secure. Okay, it looks like we're gonna be here two hours. Nobody asked you questions. We're gonna be here a long time. So anyway, let's talk about that. We're gonna get into security because for two years now, that has been our biggest complaint. We have a question in the back row. Yes, sir, Mr. Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, I realize the name of the, the group is landlord tenant. Do you guys get involved at all in tenant to tenant disputes, like neighbor disputes? Do you provide those services or not? Yes, thank you. The question, if you did not hear it, is do we get involved between a tenant and a tenant dispute? And in fact, a complaint can come from a tenant about another tenant. A complaint can come from a neighbor about a tenancy building that's next door to them. Anything we need to do in the landlord-tenant relations area, we're glad to take a look at. Uh, it, again, the, uh, we are gonna be limited to what a tenant does, and 90% of the time of our intake, the person that gave us the intake doesn't follow up with us. We have an answer for them, we can follow up, but you gotta make sure, very important, you come back to us and let us know if your problem has been resolved or not. Uh, leases are very important. We encourage things to be in writing. Even if it's a month-to-month -month lease, put it in writing. Uh, we have not, we were originally gonna show leases and examples of leases, but because of the changes in the law, uh, the things of added rent, late fees, attorneys, all these different things, we're gonna let you let this play out for maybe another two, three more months, and then maybe we'll start putting more leases up on the website. Uh, but the big thing we're gonna move into now, before we touch on this, just so you know, leases are between landlord, tenant. Big house, small house, one bedroom, 20 unit, 200 unit. Get your lease in writing. Get everything you do in writing, whether you're the tenant or the landlord. It will protect you in the long run. Now one of the things we did, I want you to think about this, back in 1974, think about the era, it's Vietnam, end of the war, economy's not the greatest, and we're having problems with people finding and keeping apartments. So the federal government, of course they're here to help, comes up with the Emergency Tenant Protection Act, which has been out since 1974. Federal act that each state can or can adopt, and each village, city, or municipality can adopt. Austin adopted this last year, in October, and then we've amended the uh, ETPA to uh, make it for 21 units or more effective uh, here in Austin. We're not really gonna to touch so much on that, but it's important because there's only a few buildings that are actually affected by the ETPA that is still ongoing because the legislation allows certain buildings, to, certain landlords to do certain things with their tenants in the, those buildings, and that has not been completed with yet. So if you have any questions, if your building is compliant or not, contact an attorney, uh, contact uh, you know, the village hall just to help you understand your rights under that. Yes, question. Here we yeah, go, number two. If you would, the prior, um, thank you. Um, you mentioned about, concerning ETPA, about units that are 21 or more. And yes, there was, I'm aware of the change from October to January. If you're in a res residing in a uh, multiple units of 21 and more, despite what happened in January, 
are you still covered by the ETPA? Question was, uh, in, in, just so you understand, in January, there was an opt-out provision added to the Austin Charter that allows the landlord to opt out. The question is, are we still under the ETPA? The answer is, it depends on whether or not that landlord has opted out, and whether that agreement has been entered into with the village, that is still ongoing. So I don't have an answer for you, depending on your building and depending on where they are with their contract with the village. Follow up? Sir, please, follow up. Would there be a, um, some sort of a list of where each of the dwellings of 21 or more, whether they've made a decision or not, or it's pending, would that be with the village? That would be with the village right now, and I don't know, but I'll turn that over to Stuart Kahan on that. No one has opted out to right. date, so anyone 21 or more is in ETPA. So, it's a building before 1174. Correct. So uh, Stuart uh, Kahan is with us tonight, our village uh, attorney, and basically he's pointed out there are no actual opt-out agreements with the village. So these uh, businesses and such technically under the ETPA. Mayor, would you like to say something? Yeah, I just want to clarify some of the language we're using because it's not technically an opt-out. Yeah. What it is is they join a class. So the only way that you can be exempt from being an ETPA building in the community that has enabled the ETPA regulations is if you join a class that is exempt. For example, any building that has 20 units or more, or 20 units or less, is an, is an exempt class based on size. The other class that was created was if the landlord decides that they will make an agreement with the village to set aside 20% of, make, make sure, remind me, make sure I'm doing the right thing here, it's been a while since I looked at our paperwork being able to you. 20% of the units, so if they have a building with 100 units, they have to agree that 20 of those units will be at 50% area median income, right? So the rents will be capped for 20% of those units for people who have demonstrated that they are at the 50% area median income level. That's the only way that they can become an exempt building. So they're actually joining a class of buildings that has agreed to create 20% of their units set aside just for people who have demonstrated the financial need for those, for those buildings. So then the rent would be less, presumably, than most of the other units in the building. It would be, the rent would be dictated by the county's guidelines for what is an appropriate rent level for somebody in that income. Question, sir. Yeah, so buildings are obviously built after 74 would not be covered under the EPTA. 74 and beyond would not be covered under the EPTA uh, prior to that, and then they would have to have so many units, etc. Okay. So here's here's the key. Here in New York State, you got a lot of aid given to you. Two of these pamphlets that are here on the table are here. So let's talk about where we are as far as this, newyorkcourts.gov. Go on www.newyorkcourts.gov and you have two tenants guides. If you're a landlord, I encourage you to read the tenants guide. There is, a, there is a landlord provision as well. Read this and I want you to take a look, updated since July of 2019, we're gonna get to that. For those of you who wanna be a landlord, thinking about being a landlord, there are two types of cases that you're gonna be associated with. And these guides will help you because this is gonna tell a tenant what happens in certain cases? And there's basically two. A non-payment, it's kind of self-explanatory, I haven't paid the rent, it's gonna be a non-payment action. And then where a lease ends, then you're gonna be in a situation where the lease ended, I stayed the following month, I held over on my lease. Hence the holdover proceeding. But this is important, this is important. We're gonna discuss asking tonight. These documents that you have before you is right here, take a look, district, city, town, or village courts, outside New York City. So, your buddy has got a friend, he's got a grandmother who knows somebody in Chicago, whose friend is an attorney with the law school somebody in Arkansas, who knows somebody in Alaska that read something. Don't listen to it. Don't Google it. If you Google landlord-tenant rights, you might be finding something out about the Bronx. My buddy in the Bronx took 12 months to get him out of there. You must understand we are outside New York City, we are not a city court, we are not a civil court, which are the five boroughs of Manhattan. We have different laws, and things will move a little bit quicker. So tenants, know your rights. Understand, if a landlord brings an action, this is a great guide, and they're right here, copies for you, or go right on the website to get them. Okay? So let's talk about what happens. Go ahead, question? No, sorry. Not yet. Let's talk about what happens. 
Now, in the court, if you've ever been in judge duty, you see everything on TV, right? It takes 20 minutes. The court takes 20 minutes. Well, a small claims action is probably one of the quickest things. You hit my car, you owe me some money, I bring you to court, you're in and out of here in one night. Summary proceeding, landlord tenant action is going to take about that quick. You come the first night, if there's a dispute, you're probably on trial the next night. The case gets started, go to court. Rarely do we see trials because it's not so much a dispute. If it is a trial, the trial is going to happen immediately. So tenants, don't take this for granted that because you know somebody in Queens or you know somebody in Chicago that took a long time. This is Westchester County. You're outside of New York City. Things could move a little bit quicker than you expect. Okay? If you have any questions, you contact an attorney or find out what it is. Again, remember, if you're going to look up something on the internet and you don't want to call an attorney, because many of your local attorneys here, believe me, they will talk to you on the phone without a fee. If you're going to hire them, they're going to, you're probably going to pay. But it may be well worth your time to retain an attorney to know your rights. Very important. Because you don't want to be on the wrong side of the, uh, the case. The case can start for non-payment. The case can start for a holdover. We're going to go through some of the changes of how that has to start. And then when you answer a case, generally you're going to appear. But don't forget, you can put an answer in writing. You can make motions. There are various things you can do to defend yourself. If you need more time, you're going to ask for more time. And we're going to discuss some of the new laws that are going to help you. But uh, it's important that you don't get to this part in a court. The first thing we want you to do if you have a problem that's why we're here tonight. We've got a landlord-tenant relations council that many villages and towns don't have. Contact us. Contact the village hall. Go on villageofossing.org. Look on the website. There's an intake form. Landlord wants to evict me. What do I do? We will be glad to contact the landlord. We can do that within the next day. Again, the key is follow up with us. Fill out a form. Give us your name. Give us the information. Give us your landlord. Let us help landlords. Someone hasn't paid your rent. Someone is. Uh, they've got smoking uh, marijuana, they've got drugs, or they've got some illegal activities going on before you go to court. If you want us to intercede, contact us. Let's see if we can help you. Again, once this goes to court, we've had many people come to us, and it's already been in court, but by that time it was too late. Not that we couldn't do anything, but we contacted the attorney or whoever was in court, and they just said, we're in court next week. We're, we're, we're not going to waste time with the landlord tenant Relations Council. You don't want to get to the point of having a warrant, the warrant is the document where a marshal will knock on your door and evict you. And at that point, you can be really in some, some bad shape. So use our offices before it gets to court. Use our offices if you just got served with papers. See if we can help you. Okay? But once it gets to court, it may move a lot faster than you thought. What has happened? June of this year, and these documents that you have are revised as well. Question, question, Matt? I noticed that you're talking all of this information, and I've gone to many of them not here, but other um, counties. And I don't see not one thing here telling the tenant that if there is an eviction notice, that they have 72 hours as far as what the work that the, the, um, the landlord does and what your rights are. You don't have anywhere near the 72 hours. We're, we're gonna get to that. The question was, hey, there's a 72 hour notice when there's a warrant of eviction. Haven't gotten there yet, but since you led me right into that line, thank you. <laughs> Let's talk about the Housing and Stability Tenant Act that was just passed in June of this year. And we're going to discuss when tenants were facing a three-day notice, 72 hours of an eviction. The law has changed dramatically for certain time periods, and we're going to discuss that right now. So just bear with me, and I'll be to your 72-hour notice. So before we get to that, there's a pet peeve that we have in the Landlord Tenant Relations Council. So before we get to the court, before we get to your lease, what's everybody usually take and do when you take an apartment? That's a security deposit. All right, landlords, landlords, security is the tenant's money. That's right. I'm sorry. Security is the tenant's money. It is not yours. Tenants, tenants, don't do this. I'm going to use my security, I'll pay my February rent, I'll be here next week. No, 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 no. The security is given to the landlord to hold for you until you vacate that premises. Only then, two parties, two consenting parties, want to apply the security to a damage or apply that to a rent. At that point, 
possessions turn back to the landlord, at that point, you may do it. Here's a common mistake. You didn't need the changes in the laws for this. I don't care if you got one unit or 10 units. You take security, cannot be commingled with your rent roll or any of the other matters. Should be held in a separate account. If you have six or more units, legally you're supposed to have that in an interest bearing account. Now tenants, when you go to leave a year later, interest in these banks, 1%, not much. So don't be looking for two, three hundred dollars in interest, unless you've been there 40 years or something, but uh, the interest bearing account, generally the lease will tell you where the account is, where the bank is. Landlords, do not forget you must have it in a separate account. If you have three or four tenants, you can put the security generally in one account because it's designated for that tenant. Do not commingle it with your money. One of the biggest changes in the law, let me get my little pointers right here. When the tenant moves out, and this is why the law came, because landlords are holding on to the money. In two years, our council being together, our biggest gripes have been return of the security deposit. You know what? So it's always one or two bad apples, and that's why this law is here. So from now on, when you return, when the tenant has vacated the premise, then now the statute reads, landlord will return the money within 14 days. Now well, the tenant took off of me, they didn't leave me my address, you know, what am I supposed to do? Well, that's not the law. The law is you will return it. Because guaranteed, that tenant is going to be looking for the security for their new apartment, right? No, no, you, you damaged the apartment. That doesn't fly anymore. It never flew in the courts in the first place. The law always was, you have to have an accounting. Well, they now made it statutory. You're going to make an itemized list for anything, for any reason, that you're keeping that security. Obviously, it's the month's rent, and you would say it's a month's rent, but you still have to give that notice to the tenant. This is how I apply your security. If you say it's, well, you, you had a picture over there and you left a little, little uh, thing on the wall, a little hole, that's not going to work. If cabinet doors are busted, if windows are busted, window shades are, okay, the receipt, the replacement window shades, whatever, an itemized list must accompany how you apply to that security deposit. And that's going to be interesting. That's going to be that's a big new change in the law. Don't fall short on that. Don't fall short on that. Because that's going to give an opportunity for the, lent, for the which happens anyway, tenant can write back into court get their security. But you're going to be responsible. If they hire an attorney, you're going to be responsible for any punitive damages, if you kept it willfully, you can find yourself, without not returning their money, owing them three times as much if it really goes that route. And I've represented many a tenant on that. So landlord's obligation, okay, it's right there for you. This presentation will be, got two questions coming, so, sir. I'm just sorry. Sorry. sorry about that. Go ahead. Um, uh, at the end Friday. of the calendar year, is it a requirement for a uh, landlord or property manager to supply each tenant with the um, income, income earned uh, from interest as part of their reporting um, to the IRS each year? Does the landlord and or property management need to supply the IRS form uh, to the tenant? Yeah. Question is whether or not the management team or uh, landlord is required by law to provide interest income earned or anything about security deposits. Uh, I'd have to, I'll refer you to legal counsel, find someone on that. We don't want to represent from our counsel what that is. It does, it does many times go by what the lease says, but there are some provisions depending on, it's a multiple unit, you're in the city, outside the city, Take that up with somebody else. I can't. Thank I don't you. want to answer that here. Thank you. This, at this point, there was another question. No? So, uh, landlord's obligation, security. I'm sorry. Did I mention that that was the tenant's money? Yeah. Got that? It's the tenant's money. Tenant's money. Got to give it back. Tenant's obligation. Please, don't use it as rent. It's your money. You, if you are moving out, you need it for your next apartment. You're going to, you know, you pay for your next apartment, which you need the security for maybe the next month's rent. Don't, don't abuse it. Right? Return there. Turn the apartment the way you got it, room clean condition, your security should come back to you. But know your rights. Just because you're not in possession anymore, there's a small claims court here in Austin, you can back to that, which our judges will tell you, it's filled with many times people coming back for security. Right? No reason to keep that. Our, again, come to the Landlord-Tenant Relations Council, even if you left the apartment, we deal with this all the time. Uh, and we're dealing with two matters uh, right now. Big change in the law too, they have made it a point to describe rent, and that is the money for the occupancy of the unit. A lot of these bigger, uh, big places now, which are these uh, 
multi-unit places with uh, high rents and all that. They've got all these wonderful fees and an air conditioner fee and a bounce check fee and you didn't pay on Thursday fee and coffee on Thursday for the hamburger on Wednesday fee. Uh, landlords should be in the, we're not banks, you know, you shouldn't be in the, the mood to buy extra rent with fees, but if your lease provides for it, that's one thing. But when we talk about actually starting a case in the landlord-tenant court, the, the courts are not going to award this anymore. They're just going to concentrate on the rent. By the way, that's always been the law. In a summary proceeding, a warrant is for the eviction of a person for the payment of rent only. That was always the case. Uh, but watch, watch all these fees. You know, it's, you can get it in a later court, not a landlord-tenant, not going to happen. Uh, the late fees, that 10% or 5% is gone, limiting it to $50 a month, which many, many of our, our colleagues in Yonkers and Mount Vernon have always had. It's never been more than 50. I notice when you get upstate New York, it's 10%. You start seeing late fees at two, three hundred dollars a month. All right, tenants, read your lease. It never. I, I get this all the time. Yeah, but can you help me out? It's a grace period. There is no grace period. Your lease says rent is due on the first day, or rent is due on the fifteenth day. It may say that five days after a late fee will be applied. That doesn't mean you get a grace period. The rent is still due on the first. Pay your rent on time. If it goes after and there's a late fee, you'll have to take that up with your landlord. But uh, pay your rent on time. Uh, the other thing, too, about these late fees and what have you, there's going to be a new change in the law. I don't think I put it in here. I'll get the summary proceeding. New change is that if you have not received landlords, if you have not received the rent five days after it was due, paid on the first and the sixth day, paid on the 15th, on the 21st, uh, 20, uh, 21st day. You have to send a letter by certified mail to your tenant saying I haven't received the rent. Now we all know, many of us know, that people don't pick up their certified mail at the post office, so what's the purpose? The legislature found it for a reason. I haven't received the rent. Maybe the, maybe the tenant did mail it in, maybe they did, they just didn't realize you got it. So five days after the rent was due, if you've not been paid, you must now send a letter it is highly, highly recommended that you keep that certified receipt copy of the letter because it can provide an affirmative defense for the tenant to say, I did pay, landlord never said I did. We're going to find out how that works in the courts coming down in the future. It is not a predicate notice. We're going to talk about that in a second. It's not the first notice that you need to tell the tenant, but it is a requirement. Also on the rent, someone pays you cash. Landlord, you must give them a receipt. Now I'll give you the receipt next week. Oh, I don't bring my receipt book with me. You must provide a written receipt for anything with cash, money orders, and such. If it's a personal check, personal check is deemed the receipt. If you're paying online, transmitting, which is popular now, uh, you're, you're, you're putting it into a portal, you're putting it into a, it's like these PayPal type situations where you're paying your, your landlord directly by your bank, that receipt on that computer printout Will, will be deemed to be the receipt, we believe. The, the statute now says transmitting payments, so I think that covers it, but anything that's been the traditional handing of the cash, money orders, landlords should provide a receipt. Landlords, it's your greatest defense in a court. I don't want to give them a receipt, you pay me. It's your greatest defense in the court, because if you only got 10 receipts, the judge asked you where the other two. Those are the two months I'm suing for. I didn't get paid, that's why I didn't give them a receipt. Believe me, landlords, this is simple paperwork that you can do, and it provides security for the tenant. Tenants, cash, come on. Pay by check, pay by money, or keep a receipt. Keep a valid accounting of your rent. Because when you get to court saying, oh, I paid him cash, uh, you know, he took it, it's not going to be a defense enough in court. So please, keep, get a receipt from the landlord for what you pay. Right? Now, I hear the biggest change is search. Do you have a question? Talking about the rent, you said rent is rent, and you were trying to isolate from the rest of the money. Does that rent fall under the rent guidelines as well? Rent guidelines as far as? Like it's considered rent, pet rent is also considered rent, pet and not rent. a fee. Pet rent. The rent is what, pet, okay, so pet, I have a, pet, a, pet fee. Pet fee. Pet, oh, a pet, pet fee, pet parking? Pet fee. A lot of places charge for pet fee. Yeah, and, it's, and I have leases, and we specifically changed them. Uh, the question, if you didn't hear, the question was, hey, what about a pet fee? What about uh, the parking fee? What about whatever fee?
and it'll say, rent is a thousand bucks, pet fee ten dollars, parking ten dollars, for a total of one thousand twenty dollars as rent. The court is now defined under this statute to read one thousand dollars was the rent. Even if your lease, even if it was just signed just now, that is now rent. Rent is specifically what it says as rent. Even if you had, if it says pet rent, it's still not considered. Pet rent. I, you're going to have to, I, a question, you say, so what if it says pet rent? It's not under rent. It says added rent too will be deemed rent. Right now, courts under this statute are, pro, are likely rent going to read the only rent that we're looking at says $1,000 rent plus, 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 that's your rent. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't prohibit a landlord later on if you've been evicted or you left on voluntary coming back into court later and suing based on the lease like you would any contract. They would be entitled to that. But that's a different court. We're going to concentrate here just on the landlord-tenant court, the summary proceeding. And they're trying to make it simpler for the judges. They're trying to make it simpler for a tenant to understand. You can have all this wonderful 20 pages, right? You see the leases, that little print like that? We know nobody reads it, but we understand the tenants can get burned on this. Because, well, you didn't pay your $1,000, but you got $200-something in pet art. Court's not going to allow it anymore. Rent is rent, as far as that goes, whatever it says on the lease. And it's going to be held to what's that rent. Landlords, you have to revise your lease. If it's going to cost you parking or pet, whatever, maybe you have to change the rent to whatever that rent is going to be. Okay, but you want to be straight with the tenant. Let the tenant know what they're supposed to pay each month. They shouldn't have to be surprised. Not fair to the tenant, sir. Uh, okay. would, it, would it be a good way to think of it as if, if something that applies to everyone across the board, in the sense that not every single person would have a car, or not every single person would have a pet. That's kind of a good way to think about it in terms of rent is rent, right? Yeah, so the question is, isn't it fair that these leases account for what's rent and somebody has a pet, you don't, They're, they have a separate lease to, I understand it, but for the purposes of what we're trying to point out tonight in this change in the law, the assembly said, we don't want anybody confused. If your lease says rent, even if it has all these other charges, when we're talking about going to a landlord-tenant court, that's likely what the court is going to resolve and, and resort to. For the purposes, for the purposes of a warrant, an eviction, and finishing the case. Okay? But don't think that your rights or other responsibilities under the lease uh, necessarily been diminished. Can I, uh, can uh, I ask question? a question? Please, ma'am. It might be, but it might not be. With the Avalons, okay? Um, if you live in the Avalons and I tell and they tell me my rent is fifteen hundred dollars a month, then all of a sudden I get an attachment that I got to pay seventy five dollars for whatever, and then you have the garbage and then you have the water and you have all these things. Is that would that be considered under this, or is that allowed? Yeah. Because so, I think the Avalons are getting over on people who. And especially those who are paying affordable. Okay. They're really burning them. So if you didn't hear the question, yeah, I've got a, I'm, in, I'm in a big place, a lot of, a lot of places, my rent's 1500 but I get an add-on to my lease. It's you know, $10 for water, 15 for the garbage. So, you know, $2 for snow shoveling fee, right? Yes. What no. happens? Is that allowable? The answer is, if you sign the lease, yes, it's permissible. But if the person in your community now wants to bring you to court, and you go in and you show the judge, I paid $1,500 every single month, and the only thing left over is the $15 here, the $10 here, which I paid a month later, but I owe, I owe $80 left. It is likely, under this new statute, that the judge is going to dismiss the case because it's no longer valid within that court because we're only looking at an eviction for rent only, what is defined as rent. Your add-ons were add-ons. They can call it added rent. They can disguise it anything they want, they might, you're still liable for it, you sign the lease, but for the purpose of a landlord-tenant action, right? We said this is going to be quick, it's going to move quickly. It's not going to be delayed, we're going to do hearings about what the garbage fee was. No, yeah. if your rent was $1,500 and you owe $3,000 for two months' rent, you could be evicted for two months' rent. Because many times with landlords, what we, what we'll do, we waive a lot of the fees. Now we're just strict with the rent. Now, now we do it. But yes. I, Another question. Please. However, if you sign a lease that provides for uh, uh, you paying some other things and you don't, 
you violate the lease. So you won't be able, uh, you will not be evicted in a non-payment proceeding for non-payment of those fees, but you may uh, be evicted in a holdover proceeding for violating your lease. The person speaking, I'd like to introduce a colleague of mine, named Mahalia Petrescu. She has come, she's provided another document here from the Legal Services of Hudson Valley. So Mahalia, thank you. What she's pointing out, so you may have an answer to your question is, yes, she can be allowed to lease, but when we come to the landlord-tenant court, you're not going to be evicted for things that are not things other defined as rent, the actual rent and the lease itself. Okay? Uh, unlawful evictions, I've had this a couple times in Peekskill, uh, Rent has ended, the, the lease has ended, you go in on the next day, it ended on August 31st, September 1. Oh, tenants are done, they didn't re renew the lease. I'm going to change the lock and kick them out. It's an unlawful eviction. You don't like the tenant. Uh, I want them out of there, they, I just I don't, they, they make too much noise. Uh, I'm kicking them out. Unlawful evictions will not be tolerated. It's never been tolerated in courts. I've defended many a uh, tenant. In fact, Mahalia's uh, crew, I was a guardian of Lida with legal services as my attorney for my, my tenant when they were just kicked out and they went to the hospital for three days and everything was missing. Unlawful evictions are going to be uh, carried, but they have now carried that into a Class A misdemeanor. This is no nonsense. If you understand the criminal law, landlords, don't do it. Follow the appropriate uh, uh, thing. Now, oops, sorry. Let's talk about, we start a case here, the big changes, and this is going to be pretty much the end of our presentation, but here we go. When you start a landlord-tenant case, you must give notice. Same as we do in a civil case, same as anything else. You gotta demand the rent. So, if it's a rent demand, you have to say, you owe me rent. Outside of New York City, I'm state New York, you could be, I come up to you three days later, I say, hey, you owe me once rent, I need it by Friday. Friday being four days later, I can commence the action in the court and be in court. That is no longer. And this is why I make a point of knowing where you're at. In New York City, you couldn't have done that. In New York City, you always had to do demand for rent in writing, and it had to be served by the marshal, because that's how we do things in the city. The marshal serves the predicate notice, the three-day notice. The marshal then serves the warrant for the petition. And then the marshal comes back to serve the warrant, and comes back an eviction. So that's what they do. So here, we have decided, the assembly has decided under the new law, it's no longer going to be a three-day notice. It will be 14 days. Landlords, pay attention to that. Also, landlords, 14-day notice must be served in the same manner as a petition if it's a non-payment. By the way, that's always been the law. But what this means is you must have a process server go and serve this piece of paper. You cannot do it yourself. Same as you can do the petition for an action. 14-day notice must specifically describe the rent that is owed and give pretty much the date that you expect that payment to be uh, made, 14 days from after that notice. If 14 days on the 15th day it has been paid, then the landlord can commence the action. So that's a big trigger. So landlords pay attention to that because it's 14 days now. And then here's another new twist in the law as well. When you commence civil action for landlord tenant, we call it a summary proceeding, right? It's summed up because we want to get possession back. That's the key to that action. Used to be, used to be, you had five days ahead of the court date, no longer than 12. In other words, it moved pretty quickly, but you couldn't serve someone and then three months later bring them to court, so you were limited by 12 and five days. So I had a three-day notice, I could do it verbally, six days later on a five-day petition, I'm in court probably within two weeks. Under a 14-day written notice, then you commence the action. The action cannot be commenced earlier than 10 days on the service of the petition. It's 14 day notice, then you gotta figure an extra day to preserve the petition, get it ready, get it going, get it to the process server. They're then gonna go serve the petition, it might take them two or three days. This is not Yonkers or Mount Vernon or Peekskill, well, Peekskill doesn't have it. Most courts have court every day. For the purpose of asking, understand. I know you see court on Monday night, you see courts on Tuesday. There's only one night we do landlord tenant actions and civil actions, and that's Thursday nights. So landlords here in Austin, Tenants here now, so just so you know, 14 day notice, and they're going to serve you with a petition. It's going to be on a Thursday night. So it might take an extra week to set up a petition for that. So now you're to maybe 21 days. They can't serve that petition earlier than 10 days prior to the court date. You might be into the next month. 
So landlords, pay attention to these new time frames. You will have your case dismissed immediately if this service of the 14-day notice or this petition is not served accordingly. It will be dismissed immediately. And that's in fairness to the tenant. Tenants, if that happens, don't rest. If you get a petition, get an attorney, get counsel, if you get a 14-day notice, and you know you owe the rent, pay the rent. If you do it, pay the rent. But understand, landlords may no longer, ah, oh, wait another month, ah, he, he lost his job, he'll be back to work next month. Landlords are no longer going to wait, to my knowledge, and what I'm seeing now in the courts, they're not going to wait three, four months anymore. Not going to happen. They're going to have to move quickly because it's going to have to take them almost a month and a half to get you to court that first month's rent. And the, isn't it that the lawyer has to show cause why? The now question here is the lawyer has to show we're cause. We're going we'll, into legality. We'll get into that. That's okay. Show cause is a special thing. It's called a motion. You must show yes. cause. It doesn't have to be a lawyer. It can be anybody no, show cause. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. But now we're now we're at the point of court. Again, what did I say earlier? Court's going to move pretty quickly. You know, Victoria's got a story. I don't know if she told you. Right? So she goes over. She sees Stewart. She says, oh, got to help me. Got it, man. He's, he's out of money. Got five kids. Mother can't work. You know, she's, she's, she's got to stay home with kids. He just lost his job. They need $3,000. They're on the street tomorrow. So he goes, Victoria, what are you talking about? Come on, come on, talk to me. So I got to get, I got to get, we got to get me money. These people are going to be on the street tomorrow. What do you mean tomorrow? Well, they're going to be evicted tomorrow. Unless I get $3,000. Well, come on, and we'll call some people, let's grab some money. By the way, Victoria, how, how do you know about this so well? <laughs> well, they're my tenants. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, uh, you got to watch these things here. The, these things will move quickly. Tenants don't rest on it. But now you've got 14 days and then a 10 day before you get into court. Okay? Uh, there's other things about the case. In a holdover proceeding, that's that other document. Talk about this quickly. Holdover means that I'm not going to renew the lease. You and I have had a great relationship for a year. Uh, you've been paying monthly. I, my kid's coming back in the military. I'm going to put him back in, so I need you to leave. At the end of a lease, generally, everybody knows the end of the lease, you're going to leave, right? You don't renew the lease. Well, what if you hold over and you stay in? They have to do the same predicate notice. They have to give you notice. However, the law has not changed on this, but it's always been this way. It'd be a 30-day notice to quit. I need you out next month. And they could do it right in. They could serve it by certified mail. People that are wise will serve it by a process server and do the same thing they would in a non-payment but generally after that 30 days, if you have not vacated, then they commence the proceeding. Changes in the law are this. In a holdover with a person one year and under, 30-day notice, that still pre prevails. If the person has been there one year to two years, it's now a 60-day notice. So you have to give them 60-day notice to vacate. If they've been there over two years, you have to give them 90-day notice to vacate. I spoke to Mahali about this, and we kind of agree. If, if you got a person who's been there, you give them 30-day notice, and then you go to court, they're gonna, the tenant's going to say, Judge, I just need another couple of weeks. It's going to take about 60 days anyway. So the law is one thing. The 90-day notice could be tight. It doesn't pro prohibit you from still paying your rent during that period, but you want to talk to an attorney about when you can and can't accept rent, but there's a change for people that just they haven't moved out yet, especially if they've been there a long time. 30, 60, or 90. This includes a little provision that was written in there. Let's go over it. Rent increase. If you intend to increase the rent more than 5%, our rents here in Austin are well over $1,000 for the average, right? 5%, more than 50 bucks. You have to give them the same 30, 60, and 90 day notes. Now, after 30 days, you start paying the extra 100 bucks, it's over 5%, or you enter in a new lease room. That's your new lease with your landlord. But if you do not do that, the landlord would have the option to commence a holdover proceeding and have you evicted in that term. Okay? Question, sir. Let's flip that. What if the um, it's in the lease as a 90-day uh, prior notice before rent, uh, the lease renewal, and the landlord or property management fails to, for example, the 89th day, um, fails to notify you of an increase or um, the actual terms 
legal terms in writing of your uh, new lease. Or they try to send you a text message to ask you whether you're going to renew or not. So they don't have to do the paperwork. What recourse does the tenant have? The question is, got a lease, says what it's supposed to do. Supposed to give me a notice. You don't do it. They sent me a text the day before when this notice was due. They didn't mail it to me. Uh, are you going to renew your lease or not? Your lease prevails, folks. Tenants, that's why we're encouraging. Get a written lease. The lease is going to tell that landlord how he's got to do it. Landlords, you all seen this? You seen the uh, Bloomberg leases down in New York City? You seen the blue the leases that are in Staples? Watch the notice provision. Sometimes it says you must get five days' notice written of a non-payment of rent. Then you may proceed with the statutory under your state. I've, I've gotten tenants off the case because they didn't serve that initial file. It's right here in the lease, Judge. I don't even need to go to New York State law. It's right here in the lease. If that lease was not followed by your landlord giving you provisions, you have defenses. The landlord should know that. And so, yeah, that's, your lease prevails. What if they ignored the 90 day, then they allowed you to pay month to month, however time, till near the end of the lease, and decide, I'm sorry, we've had a great relationship, thank you for your 10 year plus staying with me, but um, I'm not renewing your lease. Okay, are you talking about, all right, so here's the question. Uh, holding over on the lease, I'm still paying the landlord, right. and then they just come to me and say, okay, that's it, we've had a great discussion. So we're gonna assume that's a holdover proceeding. Let's understand this. I write you a letter. I say that I want you out at the end of October. I have to give you 30 days notice, assuming you're under one year. If I give you that letter today, it's not 30 days to the end of October. If I give you a letter today, it must be for the end of November, first. Come December 1, if you haven't left, it is deemed the landlord is no longer interested in you being a tenant. Landlords, if you accept money after December 1st from your tenant, by law you have renewed your landlord-tenant relationship. Tenants, I get this all the time. Dewey, they wouldn't take my money. I, I got the money, they wouldn't take it. The reason the landlord may not take your money and you're going to court, well, why is it? Because the landlord, by law, cannot take it. When the landlord comes to court and you are before the judge, You'll hear a judge, the term of art is, you may accept rent or you may accept use and occupancy without prejudice. This way the tenant can stay in, they can pay their use and occupancy. The landlord is not prejudiced, they haven't renewed the relationship, they're just giving the tenant a little bit more time to move out. We see this in foreclosure proceedings, we see this in long-term tenancies. The tenant just needs an extra place to go. Maybe the tenant is moving on to an assisted living facility, they need a couple extra months. The family is helping to pay. And at that point, the term is called use and occupancy. We don't call it rent anymore. But you've got permission now from the court, which is why the landlord brought you there. They want to get their money. They're willing to give you more time. They'll give you the three months, but they need to get the money. So they actually commence the action. That doesn't make sense. Why didn't you just take the money? Because now they've renewed the lease. So that's, that's where that comes from. Did I answer your question on that? Thank you. Okay, sir. Accepting a check, but not cashing it. Does that, does that make a difference? Is yeah, accepting a check and then not cash it. Under New York State, not law, but under the, what we call case law, what the judges have decided, what the higher courts have decided, if you don't return that check, generally within 48 hours, right? Within a reasonable time, and that's like 48 hours, and I'm gonna to touch on this real quick, that's deemed acceptance. That landlord has accepted the check. Here's a key, landlords, section eight. For those of you who don't know, uh, our Section 8, we have a Section 8 office here in Austin. The team is great. They will work with you as a tenant, and they will work with you as a landlord. Maryland does a great job there. Section 8 pays the landlord to help subsidize the rent, and the tenant pays the remaining portion. Tenant goes to vacate, they get a notice to vacate. Tenant doesn't pay their rent, but the Section 8 check comes in and the landlord accepts it. That's an acceptance of the rent. Landlord's obligation, you must return to Section 8 immediately. How you get around that, landlords, when you serve a 14-day notice for non-pay or a holdover, serve the Section 8 office. Inform them what is going on. Section 8's gonna to wanna to know that tenant is not paying their rent because that abides them from maybe getting Section 8 in future cases. 
let the Section 8 office know, but you cannot accept the rent. The same way you cannot hold on to a check. Oh, I've got it here. I was going to wait for the court. You give them the check on Wednesday. You held on to it. You came to court Thursday night, and the judge says you can accept the rent. It would probably be deemed acceptable and not renewing a landlord-tenant relationship. But if you hold on to it, I would think more than two, three days, it's an acceptance of the rent. Got to return, got to return it back to the tenant. Okay, sir. Yes, so the question I have is more or less along the lines where the lease states that you must give 60 days written notice if you intend on not renewing the lease. Um, however, this new company came in, and when they took over, um, they didn't tell us about the lease or even give us like they should give it to us three months ahead of time, so we had time to mull it over and think about what we wanted to do. And so the lease period ended, and after the lease period ended, they finally got in touch with me with the first period. And then the next year I had to ask for it, and this year I had to ask for it again. It's almost as if they're not complying with what they're asking for within the terms themselves. Yeah. He's saying that, uh, hey, I had a lease, they gotta give me, I gotta give them 60 days notice that I wanna vacate, to leave, in fairness to the landlord, but then they're not giving me the same 60 day notice. They're coming in with a new lease next year, it, you didn't renew your lease. Landlords, Pay attention if that's a new lease. Now, if the new lease of a new managing company came in and they have new leases, they're going to have new leases. Uh, again, a situation like that, contact the local attorney, contact somebody about that. Each one of those situations will be different. Guess what? We're right here for you. We'll be glad to help you with that. Many times, our very first case we had as a new board, but thanks to the mayor, trustees Levin, who, who formed us, our very first case was a lady who kept writing to the management company. She, and she wouldn't get anywhere. I can't get this, I can't get this done. We look at it and we said, right? Ma'am, that management company's been gone for three months. We contacted, on her behalf, the new managing agent. And he says, we'll be glad to help her out. Within a week and a half, that managing agent, the new one, was in that building with an entire tenants meeting. They had the whole building, had a dinner, they had, they, not a dinner, but they had a meeting. We're the new management. By the way, this is our new mailing address. It's our new phone number. The problem is solved right away. The, the tenant did not know, as to your point in your question, didn't even know who the new managing agent was. So, man, so so you have a managing agent or whatever, make sure your tenants know who you are. Man. So by law, the new, the new, the new um, agency don't have to notify the tenants that they are the new company? question is, well, by law, do they have to, the new managing agent comes in, these big buildings, they use agents, not necessarily the landlord, yeah. but by, by law, they have to tell you? You know what? It's not by law. It's just good business. If I'm a, if I'm a good managing agent, I'm going to tell you, uh, stop paying the old person. I'm the new person. I'm going to fix your pipes. I'm going to take care of your building. You got to come to me. So shame on the new managing agent if they don't do that. Whether or not it's by law, you know, sometimes they sometimes managing agents take over for old, older corporations. It takes them one or two months to get into the swing of things. But you know what? That's just good business. So a landlord paying attention to their business should be telling their tenants. We're the new folks in town. Yes, sir. So if they continue to do that, even if after the meeting in a couple of years, they should be in the swing of things by now. They can't penalize you for not having it done in a timely manner as they're requesting. Question, the question is, so we go back to this lease, and they, they keep doing it, and they keep doing it, and they keep doing it. At that point, you have to, you want to talk to local council? Or talk to us. We'll, we'll help you resolve the issue, because we, I, I can't answer the question depending on what the lease says, if it's a new managing agent, if they're just purposely not doing it. I don't know. I don't know. At that point, take it up on that one. We'll be glad to help you with the situation. That's perfect for what we can do for you without having to get an attorney at that point. At this point, yeah. Uh, say if the owner is selling their house and they sell it, and the new person comes in and says they want to bring their family, move their family to the house. Does that 90 day still count for you to have to leave? This is a new owner buying the premises. Yes. Okay. So the question is. Been there, my, my landlord is now selling, new owner coming in. You're going to want to talk to an attorney or talk to somebody on each individual case. Some places, they cannot sell the house until it's vacant. Before I close, you evict all your tenants out. I want them out. Some people don't want that hassle. You got paying tenants? Well, I'm not going to, I'm going to take the rent roll. I'm going to buy the place. You're going to turn the security over to me. I'm going to create a new security account and you tenants are going to stay. That's an individual case. If you wish, we'll be glad to discuss that with the incoming landlord on, on the intake form that Althema showed you.
tell us who your old landlord is. We'll try and kind of, we'll find out who the new incoming person is. It depends on what the new landlord wants to do with the property. So, do they have to give you 90 days notice? Depends on the person going to evict you. But if you've been in occupancy less than a year, they're going to give you 30 days notice if they want you out. If you've been there a year between two years, they're going to give you 60 days notice. Been there over two years, many times you buy a house, people have been there many, many years. It's a 90-day notice. It's going to be a transition, and that's exactly what has to happen. Okay, but on each individual case, something like that, come talk to us. We'd be glad to talk to the new owner coming in. Do you have any, yes, ma'am. I have similar or same question, but I didn't hear or understand. If you have to give two months' notice on the tenant, you have to give two months' notice before you uh, leave, before the lease is over. But you're only given about less than two weeks um, the renewal and what it's going to cost. Is that protocol? Is that, you know? So the question is kind of following along to, hey, I'm a tenant. You're supposed to give me 60 days. I'm supposed to give them 60 days notice when I want to get out. I don't know if I want to get out because I haven't seen my new lease yet. I don't know what my increases are. Less than is that protocol? And they give me this two weeks later. Now i got to make a decision. It's bad business for the landlord because they don't they want to keep you as a tenant and, well, <laughs> keep you there? They, no landlord wants a vacant lease of an apartment. They don't want that. So why not get in? But you have rights. If they haven't renewed your lease, if they haven't done that, what do we say? They've got to go through this new set of legislation where they're going to have to give you the appropriate notice. So if you just got a two-week notice and you haven't renewed your lease yet, Landlord's going to play the game. Okay, then I'll serve. But they're going to have to serve you the 30-day notice. You didn't renew really 60-day or 90-day, depending on how long you have been in occupancy of the apartment. Within that 90 days, you'll probably be able to decide, uh, I'm going to renew my lease. Landlord would probably prefer to do that. So but that go ahead, go follow. So that supersedes the two months notice. Not the so the answer is, does that supersede the two-month notice? The two-month notice at that point would have already passed. But if you have a question about what your lease says. And what the provisions are that the land would have to take, contact us. But then, something like that, that might be contact a local attorney. It's a quick question on the phone. Many attorneys won't charge it. They'll say whatever the lease states. But the two months they have, if they've already passed that 60 days provision, and now you're like a couple weeks away, that's moot at this point. The answer is yeah, they should have followed it. But okay, you, you are where you are. Look at look at the situation you're at. You don't want to not answer something and then be sitting on the. Uh, a fast track on a summary proceeding. But the holdover proceeding, renewing leases, all that, that may have been the reason the legislature said we want 30, 60, 90, especially people that have been there a long, long time, long time tenants. We're not gonna just have them kicked out for 30 days after that. Yeah. All right, are there any other questions? Anybody we can do um, for you? Oh, uh, she was asking about the 72 hour notice oh, and wanted to get there. Good, so let's say we're at the worst end of it. You haven't paid the rent. Court has decided the warrant will issue. Okay, it's going to go to a local constable, the sheriff, and you're now going to be evicted. The usual past pattern was you receive a 72-hour notice on your door. So your person, they can leave it on the notice. By the way, tenants, I know you get upset. Why did they leave it on my door? I'm so embarrassed. They have to by law. They've not served you personally with papers, whether it's the petition or the warrant of eviction. I know it's in big letters. You are being removed. I know it's embarrassing. They have to do that by law, all right? So I know a lot of tenants want to avoid service. They don't want to answer the door. They know the eviction's coming. Don't, the, the posting on the door is proper. There is no longer a 72-hour notice in provision, three days. It is now 14 days. Do not wait, Mr. and Mrs. Tenant, for the 13th day to go running over to the court and ask for relief for more time. Uh, Generally, in Austin, for landlords, no landlord wants to wait an additional 14 days, but really here in Austin, if you think about it, we only have court one day a week. So if the tenant comes to, and you mentioned this term, in order to show cause, it is an order from the court showing cause why I need that warrant of eviction removed. I gotta show cause why I need to do something. Well, the judge may sign that, but you're not gonna probably get into the following Thursday, so you get an extra week there. So tenants, don't wait. If you get a warrant of eviction, just because it says 14 days, if you need more time and you know you need, come to court and work that out. So you did something wrong in court prior that you had this warrant. Maybe you weren't noticed, maybe you had defenses. Come to court early, as early as you can. Landlords, when you get your warrant of eviction, 
to give it. You're going to give it to the local constable or the sheriff. I understand it's 14 days. Yeah, but uh, he used to get the apartment next week. I understand it's going to be 14 days before the constable can then turn the premises back to you. Okay? Landlords, if a little piece of paper comes your way and it says, come to court, and an order shall cause an emotion, staying the warrant, show up in court. You're not going to proceed with the eviction. Okay? If you, if you tell, the constable's not going to do it. Well, the constable didn't do it, so I went in and I changed the locks. It's called an unlawful eviction. And you just saw the new statutes, now a misdemeanor. Don't do it. The court will protect both sides. The court will protect both sides. So let, let, follow your directions. It says to come to court. Come to court. If you can't come to court, prior to coming to court, come to us. Let's get you before you get to court. Okay? Even if you're post-judgment, you want, you can always contact us. Understand, landlord-tenant counsel, if you're in a warrant of eviction, you're in that 14-day window, we may not be able to do anything for you. We can't do anything for you legally. But certainly give us a call. Maybe we can get a hold of the landlord for you at a time. Yes, ma'am. What are you guys, what are your hours? You're looking at it. We're all volunteers. We are, <laughs> we are volunteers. We are just like you. Okay. We are, talk to your mayor and your trustees. I think we're, a lot of the different councils in Austin are all volunteer. Okay. We're all volunteers. Our hours are when an intake comes in. Uh, one of us will be assigned that case, and we're going to contact you to see what your what your case is about. You have the right numbers. Did you give? Because a lot of times we get an intake form, you don't tell us who the landlord is. I don't have a name to call. Uh, you don't give me a phone number to contact. If you just give me a mailing address, <laughs> the only thing I can do is mail to the landlord your 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 concerns. If you give me a phone number, I can call that person right then and there. So on that intake form that Althema showed you earlier, fill that out as completely as possible. You can either fax it into 16 Croton Avenue, you can call us, they will get a hold of one of us and we'll be in touch with you. You, you can email, the mayor and the, the trustees are great if you email them, they, or Mr. Kahan, they will get that information to us as soon as possible, but it's, it's 24 hours. Gretchen uh, does that whole night shift, she'll be, if you guys have a three o'clock in the morning, you call her, she'll be glad okay. to take care of this for you. Right? You got the night shift this year? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, on your bullet point here, the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of uh, 2019. You state, states, uh, standing in October 2019, landlords must give 30, 60, or 90 days notice of lease termination or rent increase of 5% or more, depending on how long the tenant has lived there. Do you have any clarification on the last part, depending on how long sure. the tenant ha has sure. been on there? And, I and then the second part is, is there a cap now? In other words, can, so for example, it says here 5%, and the landlord says, ah, oh, you know, I really want to rehab my whole thing so I can increase my, my revenue and so on. I'm going to go up 50, 75%. Okay. So, two-fold question. One, and I, I'm sorry if you didn't hear me, but I did mention this. On the time frame, if you're raising the rent 5% or more, or you're just not renewing the lease, if the tenant has been in the occupancy less than a year, it's a 30-day notice, the way it is right now. If you've been there one year to two years, it's a 60-day notice. That's the difference. And if you've been there over two years, two years or over, it is 90 days notice. This also applies if you're increasing the rent 5%. So the second part of this question is, is there a cap? What if he gives me a $300 a month increase in the rent? He's got to give you notice. He's, he is not... He or she, the landlord, is not limited to 5%. There's, what they're saying is if you're going to start paying $300 more a month in rent, you know, if you sign a new lease to that, that's, that's going to be up to you. I'd certainly talk to counsel, contact somebody, contact the Landlord-Tenant Relations Council. Maybe we can talk to the landlord, find out what's going on. Uh, if the landlord really wants you out, I, I just say I'm not renewing the lease. Just, you don't have to threaten them with higher rents. Just if you're not going to renew the lease, don't renew the lease. That's all. But you got to give them the right provision. You need hundred dollars more a month. Talk to your tenant. Talk to them. Maybe the tenant can't afford it. Can't tell you how many seniors. Pardon me. How many seniors that I've helped to represent? They they can't do fifteen dollars a month because of their CVS bill or a Walgreens bill or whatever. Talk to your tenants. You would be surprised how many landlords here in Austin have waived rent for a year have not increased rent. 
in the understanding the following year they raised it 20 bucks instead of 10. There are a lot of landlords that will work with you. Very good. We got some great landlords in the area. We got some landlords who just won't work with you. And then you have to make that decision 30, 60, or 90 days later whether to find a new place. Right. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I saw that, is it a new law that security is only one month? Oh, yes. Thank you very much. What if your security is way over one month? Okay. Are you, do you have the right to ask for some of it back? Sure you do, yeah. Uh, under the new law, security is one month's rent. The equivalent to one month's rent. Okay. Idea, think about this here. My guy, I got two kids, my wife's working, but we're going to get a new apartment. I got to go home for security, one month's rent. Oh, the landlord wants the last month's rent. I got to pay a broker fee, that's one month's rent. I'm into eight months, I'm at eight, nine thousand dollars, maybe ten thousand. That's not affordable housing. I can't afford to get a new apartment. The legislature, and this happens all throughout New York State. So understand that, hey, security is one month, no more than one month's rent. You can't say, I'm taking two months' rent. It will be deemed added security. You can't, you're allowed to take the one month's rent, obviously, for your first month and security. In July, we had a lot of clients that actually paid two months of security or three months. And we worked out with landlords, we either gave them back, they had paid the next two, three months in a row, or they actually physically wrote the check back to the client, the, the tenant, however the tenant wanted to do it. Some of them just then went to their next three months' rent as opposed to security, but they're still only holding one month security. I'm sorry, did I mention security? Whose money is that? It's the tenant's money, okay? So make sure if you took two months security, you give that one month security back, because whose rent is it? Whose money is it? It's the tenant's money, not yours. If you apply it to your next month's rent, that's an agreement. On the chain, we had this in the change of law in July and August, but yeah, they, they, and they shouldn't be holding on to two months security, not. You paid two months security back in January and your lease came in and the law changed in June. Contact an attorney, technically that landlord is probably still entitled to the two months. It's still being held for you. But you know, the, the questions like that, maybe get you know, a hold of an attorney on that one. Uh, but your money would still be held by the landlord because it's your money. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, say a tenant has been in a building for like five years Actually, yeah, and the question is, okay, next year I, I, my rent comes up, but it doesn't match my security. Is the landlord allowed to ask for the extra $10, extra $100 to match that security? And the answer is, yes, it, you'll see it in the lease provision, generally in the lease renewal, you will see, here's your new lease, you are going up by $10, we're adding $10 more to the security. Uh, it has not yet been challenged in the court, but I don't think it will be found unreasonable because you're actually, what are you doing? It's your money you're putting in there to secure your money, right? And that's for when you leave, landlord's gonna give all that money back to you either way. But I will see that generally in new lease renewals, the extra added $10, whatever, $100 to match the oncoming rent. Now, he had never taken a rent increase. He was taking a rent increase, but never asked, now he, this year he could actually, uh, you know, after 10 years now, you owe me another 500 security. That may not be found uh, reasonable. Again, contact an attorney or contact us. Well, you know, at, at that point you're still secure, but you know, maybe over time you pay a little bit more into the security. But again, ten, uh, landlords, don't fool around with security. If you want more security, ask for it. But, you know, if a tenant can't afford it, you're worried about what they're paying for on the rent. Okay? If you want to evict somebody because they didn't give you ten more dollars for the security, is that a business? Is that a wise business decision? Maybe think about it. If the tenant never wants to pay more to the rent, more to that, that's what we're here for. We'll be glad to help you resolve an issue and maybe help out with a problem. Contact us. We're glad to do it. Any other questions? I have a question. Does Austin have the right or is it legal that they can make their decision as to who comes into their community, into this community, and based on FICA scores and things of such? The question is, can, I don't know about Austin necessarily. Well, I'm, I'm speaking about of Austin. Okay. And we're going to stay right here in Austin. Can a landlord look at your FICA scores, look at this and all that? There are actually changes in the law that prohibit landlord. First of all, there's, discrimination is out. Landlord discriminates, 
race, color, creed, gender, whatever, that's not going to fly. It's a federal case, much less not an Oscar. But when it comes to credit scores, there's a new law now. Landlord may not ask, they can ask to get a credit history and all that, but two things happen. If you come into them with a credit rating or whatever, they have to accept that, and then they cannot charge you. If you don't have that, they cannot charge you, I think it's more than $20? $20. $20. Well, no more, you got to pay 100 bucks for a credit score and wait for TRW to get back to you and all that. Wow. We also have, uh, five years ago, the, uh, uh, I'm going to screw up the name of it, the rental income, uh, there was a provision in the law where you can't discriminate against uh, source of income. So, a source of income, thank you. All right, you so, you can't? Can I? You cannot, you can't, you cannot you discriminate not. against anyone. So if somebody oh. comes in trying to get an apartment and they said, well, your FICA score is, let's say, 12 digits less than what Ostning wants, they can say no? Okay. Well, when you say less than what Ostning wants, I don't well, know what that means. The reason I'm saying Ostning because I came here into Ostning and I was denied because my FICA score wasn't high enough or elevated enough to be in the standards of Ostning. So the question is, when I came here to ask and moved in, they, the, landlord, the, the landlord denied you, is that what you heard? No, not the Who, landlord. Who's asking? When you say I Austin. spoke to the mayor. Okay, I'll tell you what, in a question like that, I will, I will leave that with you and the mayor and the council. Well, that, I mean, I mean, that gets it's beyond not about our, the mayor uh, being our a personal person or anything. It's about what is right, what is wrong. Because it's legal or it's not legal. That's yeah. the bottom line. And the answer to your question is, Austin is not your landlord whoever you're coming in here to do a landlord, but if there's some questions. Our village manager here with us, Karen, help me out of this one. Oh, I, I, I think I, I met Karen. Most landlords, um, historically, have been able to get credit scores that are much higher than what they have as long as they employed that universally across the board, that was something that landlord determined. For the Austin, for Austin's affordable housing policy, for the set asides, there has historically been a, a credit score that that uh, was deemed part of the criteria for evaluating somebody. Um, so that might have been the case. So the answer um, to the question. And it's only for Austin set aside for believing it's Yeah. Well, the, it may be specific. Is, and I'll tell you so we don't. Uh, no, I'm not trying to get into it. The answer to the question. Well, what's corporate? The answer to the question there is that uh, in certain areas we have affordable housing programs here in Austin, and on those programs there are going to be certain guidelines that certain tenants must meet, and if you have any questions about that, contact the Village of Austin at that point. Uh, that's that's, not, that's not going to be for us. Now, if you have that situation, you want to come to the Landlord Tenant Council, we're certainly going to go to the Village of Austin. That's corporate. Uh, our council has a question. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. And Ms. Feldman, did you want to add to that? Me? Liz? No. No? She's waving hello. Okay. <laughs> and if you, have that, if you have that same question at 3 o'clock in the morning, Gretchen. I'll try to grow attention to Karen's comments. Any other questions? I can have a question on this one. Yes, please. Some of those guidelines are not really existing. Well, according to the Office of Public Housing, there's a guideline that says that you have to have a certain level of income. Well, the question way back to some of the guidelines for affordable housing are not realistic. But that's something that we at Landlord Tenant Council do not recommend. Again, if you have a situation with the affordable housing, situations with that type of question, contact the village manager, contact the village housing, they'll certainly lead you in the, the right direction. But that, if we got that question, I think that's where we're going to have to resort to. We don't, we don't really touch it on that. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? Sir? The question is how do how does someone set the rate for the cost of the rent? Okay, it, it's a business decision by the landlord. The landlord decides I have got to pay a tax on us. I got to pay a water bill. I'm going to have so many tenants. And I'm going to set my rent up to be this, and have a couple of dollars to make a profit. Landlords aren't in here to make to break even. It's a business. Well, if he makes a lot of money, he makes a lot of money. If he makes little money, he makes little money. The cost of an apartment uh, is directly related to what that landlord can say need. And the next house over might be a lot less, even though it's the same house. That's simply a question. And that's a decision between you 
and your landlord when you sign that lease. You decided that this is what you want to pay. Well, yes. So yeah. I know one lady worked in the bank. She lived over here. She said she paid a lot of money in the bank. Yeah. She said, I better move to, to Georgia and yeah. buy my house. And, and he says, hey, I pay a lot of money in the rent. <laughs> but ironically, on Austin, we had a, when we were discussing various things many, many years, about two, three years back, it was found that Austin is one of the most affordable communities in Westchester. And this is volunteer, this is many of our landlords have kept their rent fairly low because that's what the market, that's what the climate allowed. And many times landlords, an elderly person, or maybe they had a family that was struggling, they didn't raise their rent. They could have brought it to what's called market rate. You see some of these big companies coming in and they're changing the, the way the game is now. But Austin actually has been very, very affordable. Uh, but there's a difference between, I know we've had the determination, just so everybody knows, ETPA, rent regulation, these are not the same as affordable housing. Affordable housing is kind of a uh, new builders coming in, uh, certain class of buildings. Affordable housing is trying to make it affordable for Austin tenants to be to stay here. If you have questions on that, talk to those men. That's going to go by case by case basis of how that works. Okay. Yes, sir. What is a, uh, What would you recommend if the landlord accepts partial rent for the and with, with the promise that the tenants can pay the remainder at the end of the month or whatever, and the tenant doesn't pay? If the landlord proceed as a, as a regular eviction? Okay, so the question is, a uh, landlord uh, tenant comes up to him and says, hey, you know, I owe a thousand bucks, I can only give you 500 now, I'll give you 500 the exit of the loan. Take 500. Balance is still $500, right? Landlord, the tenant does not pay the remaining $500. Is that your question? Yes. Can you now commence an action? The answer is yes. You didn't reduce the rent, you just said I'll take the money later. Uh, and maybe you're trying to do the right thing by the tenant, you're trying to help the tenant who just ran into a tough month, and they didn't pay. The following month, remember, in that situation, now the next month's rent is due. So if you want to do the same thing, okay, I'll take the 500 now, but now I'll take another 500 at the end of the next month. Next thing you know, two, three months down the road, now this person is two or 3,000, but guess what? You are now going to take about a month and a half before you get the person into court. So I encourage every landlord, tenant is in trouble, continue to help them. Continue. If you can give them a week, give them a month, great. But if you go that route, and tenants, the landlord, he used to help me out, he used to do this, he was always great, give me an extra week. If they don't do it from now on, you may understand the new laws, maybe they don't want to wait two or three more months anymore because it's going to take them two or three months to get to court. But you know, landlord, there's nothing better than a landlord and a tenant working out that together. If you need an extra week, you can pay it an extra week, tenants. Pay the rent the extra week if you can do it. Landlords, you can help out your tenants, do it. If you have an issue, come to us first. Because you don't, once you get into that court system, whether it takes 14 more days or not, it's going to move pretty quickly. Okay? A great question. But work, it's, a, it's what we call the Landlord Tenant Relations Council. Good relations, good business will, pro will provide a great uh, atmosphere for us all. Any other questions? Anything else we can do for you? I want to thank Altima for putting this whole program together. When you leave, there's a sign-in sheet out here on the website. You get these information, but if you want to put your email and contact, we'll be glad to get you the information as well. We might want to mention that GoTV will have it on Friday. For those of you... Friday? Friday? I think so. it'll be put, uploaded Friday. GoTV in Austin is here tonight. It should be on for Friday night.